from a defabricated solar-powered garden shed in Rockland County, New York, USA. This is Stand Up with Pete Dominic. On today's episode, tips on staying focused at the home office when your kid's in the middle of a hormonal meltdown. And now, the podcast host who has no worries for such things because he just finished puberty last week, Pete Dominic. Thank you, Pete Coe, and as usual, you are not far off, my friend. Thank you very much for joining me here today on Stand Up. I have an excellent guest and conversation with him, a legendary comedian, a guy who knows everyone and everyone knows him in the world of comedy. DC Benny joins me for the first time, and we had a really wonderful, thoughtful conversation. We hadn't talked in several years, so I reached out to him, and I think you're really going to like it. But first, I just want to get to mention that uh, the universe, I feel like, is, is disrupted on its access spiritually because of the horrific disaster that took place in Turkey in Syria where the the numbers now have reached uh, well over 10,000 souls dead in an earthquake it's i'm seeing now 15,000 in Turkey in and uh, Syria good god if you're paying attention to the news then you can almost attribute energy being affected i know i sound a little ridiculous talking that way but it's just i mean fifteen thousand human beings in an earthquake dead it's even if you're not paying attention to the news and didn't know that it happened could you still feel it you know the butterflies wings flapping in china affects you here that whole idea i subscribe to that too some extent, but certainly, I mean, it's 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 affecting. I feel like it affects the universe. It's, it's a horrible thing, a horrible, horrible tragedy. So I just wanted to mention that, acknowledge that if anybody's kind of feeling uh, a little bit uh, unexplained uh, negativity or if things are feeling good, things are feeling a little worse. You know, I don't know. It's just worth throwing it out there. Sorry for if that sounds weird, but it's something I feel like I, I, I think about. It affects me as I think it probably should most people. So, all right. Well, with that being said, the other thing I do want to just quickly mention yesterday on Capitol Hill was just another shit show. The State of the Union. I saw somebody write the the SOTU was more of an STFU. State of the Union was more of a shut the fuck up for Joe Biden. And I saw other reaction like, I don't know, it was uh, ABC's John Carl saying that Republicans uh, really made themselves look badly. And I think Chris Wallace said they did themselves a real disservice and like, you know, made themselves look bad on their behavior. I forget the exact quotes, but I just that that kind of reaction to it, I kind of thought was like, no, they didn't. I mean, that's that's what they their base wants. Their base wants them to be rude and maniacal and unruly and chaotic and angry and immature and name calling. That's that's there's a lot of people in the Republican base that want that behavior, that believe that cruelty is the point. So I just wanted to push back on on that narrative when you hear some analysts and commentators say, oh, they look so bad. Yeah, to most of us, they do, but not to their base that wants them to behave that way. I mean, Marjorie Taylor Greene didn't just start acting that way. She's been acting this way before she got elected. That's how she got elected. And it's how she got reelected. Come on now, son. So. The best performance, though, uh, came from, again, from Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, who turned this whole hearing yesterday on its head, where this narrative has been going on forever that Facebook and Twitter want to silence conservative voices. I mean, if we're really going to minimize it, of course, the truth is Twitter and, and other social media platforms have rules and regulations, and conservative voices are constantly breaking them <laughs> with racism and sexism. The two are the same. The people who are doing the bad things that are breaking the rules are also often conservatives. Not always. That's for sure. So a lot of people break the rules around misinformation and disinformation around COVID-19 and vaccines and other things. Could be people threatening people. So they, there's all kinds of reasons why you get your, your Twitter account suspended. You don't play by the rules. It just so happens that so often it's conservatives that are actually doing that and spreading that misinformation. So 
this idea that they're trying to silence conservative voices has been this narrative. And so yesterday, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez uh, talked. Uh, well, I'll just play it for you. I think I've set it up well enough. I should say she's talking to a panel of former Twitter executives that were there to testify at the House Oversight Committee. Miss Navarroli, let's talk about something real. I'd like to show you a tweet posted by former President Trump about my colleagues and I on July 14th, 2019. It says in part, quote, why don't they go back and help fix the totally broken and crime infested places from which they came? Then come back and show us how it's done. These places need your help badly. You can't leave fast enough. I'm sure that Nancy Pelosi would be very happy as quickly to work out free travel arrangements. A day or two after that, uh, Donald Trump publicly uh, incited, you know, violence at a rally uh, targeting four congresswomen, including myself, saying, go back to where you came from. And Ms. Navarroli, as I understand it, you are uh, the most senior member of Twitter's content moderation team or a senior member of Twitter's content moderation team when this was posted. Um, as part of your responsibilities, did you review this tweet? Yes, it was my team's responsibility to review these tweets. And what did you conclude? My team Ray, made the recommendation that for the first time we find Donald Trump in violation of Twitter's policies and use the public interest interstitial. For the first time? Yes. And at the time, Twitter's policy included a specific example when it came to banned abuse uh, against immigrants as in they specifically included the phrase, go back to your country or go, or go back to where you came from, correct? Yes, that was specifically included in the content moderation guidance as and an you, example. You brought this up to the vice president of trust and safety, Del Harvey, correct? I did, yes. And she overrode your assessment, didn't she? Yes, she did. Um, and something interesting happened after she overrode your assessment. A day or two later, Twitter seemed to have changed their policies, didn't they? Yes, that trope, go back to where you came from, was removed from the content moderation guidance as an example. So Twitter changed their own policy after the president violated it um, in order to potentially accommodate his tweet? Yes. Thank you. Um, so much for bias against right wing on Twitter. Oh, God, yeah. Just great job by Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. And never never forget the horrific racist things that Donald Trump said. Mehdi Hassan tweeted about that clip. One of the most racist things Donald Trump ever said as president, telling non-white squad members to, quote, go back to their countries was something Twitter decided to accommodate and change their own rules for. But sure, tell me more about Twitter's liberal pro-democratic bias. I guess he's just restating what she said there. But yeah, really important moment, I thought. the most One of the most important moments moments or best points re realistic r reality point based points being made yesterday and then marjorie taylor green kept holding up giant cards with uh her tweets on them and a, a picture of her account being suspended image and i just kept thinking about how that was someone's job to go print those out and then i was thinking where do those giant cards with marjorie taylor green's tweets live does she sign them and auction them off to her fans <laughs> I love how she was wearing that stupid white mink coat and everybody was captioning it. Where well, go get me more Dalmatians. Corella DeVille reference. OK, well, I am excited to bring you my conversation with DC Penny today. Thank you very much for uh, tuning in. I think you're going to really like this. I hope to see you if you are a subscriber at tonight's Hangout. The link should be emailed to you. But tonight, 8 p.m. East, be there or be alone. I mean, join us. Come on. What are you waiting for? It's going to be a party tonight at 8 o'clock. Looking forward to seeing you there. Sign up now if you're not already a subscriber. Stand up with Pete.com or Patreon.com slash Pete Dominic. Okay, well, what can I say about DC Benny? Other than he is a New York comedy legend, and every comedian of a certain generation uh, around 1995 up until now, because he's still out there working, knows DC Benny. He grew up in Washington, D.C., and he actually really made a name for himself on what we call like the black circuit, the black circuit. Uh, it used to be called the Chitlin circuit, as a matter of fact, by uh, black comedians and others, you know, and he performed at the Apollo. And he performed in front of all kinds of different audiences as well in New York and across the country. He had his own Comedy Central special. He was a top finalist on NBC's Last Comic Standing. He's also done a lot of acting in commercials, and he is an expert storyteller. He teaches storytelling and comedy, and he's open for the best of 
the comedians of our generation, and they all know him and love him, and he has just had an amazing career. He's really one of my all-time favorite comics, and he was also a really, really nice guy, and his reputation is that he's just a, a, a very good guy, a hardworking guy, a kind and generous guy, and... So I wanted to, I've been following him on Instagram and seeing all the different things he's doing in his life. And he's uh, got these rental uh, properties that he fixed up himself, he and his wife. And I just was like, you know, let me just reach out to DC Benny and see if we can connect and and have a a thoughtful conversation. And we sure did. And forgive me for kind of being self-indulgent here and asking him, you know, kind of what he thought of me. But that that was something I felt like I needed to know. I wanted to, I wanted his validation because I always looked up to him and admired him, and he made me, of course, feel very validated, very good here at at the beginning. So his website is dcbenny.com. He's a great follow on Instagram, and I think you should definitely follow him there. And you can see him performing stand up all over the country, all over the New York area. And if you're thinking about doing stand up and you want to hire someone to uh, coach you, he's really, really good at that. You should, he's the best at that. So you should contact him. He's done it all. And now he's done Stand Up with Pete Dominic podcast, the biggest opportunity of all of them. <laughs> uh, I kid, but I'm very happy to have him here. Ladies and gentlemen, I bring you what I think is a really thoughtful, very entertaining conversation with DC Benny. Yeah, the legend lives. There he is, DC Benny, one of my favorite, all-time favorite comedians, and I would add like men in comedy, people in comedy, because you're one of the you're one of the good ones, man. Thank you so much for joining me. It's been way too long. Well, thank you, and and right back at you, man. Right, I, I know my my lighting isn't uh, quite uh, studio lighting here. But we'll we'll make it work. And uh, right back at you. It's good to be spending a little time. It's been years, I think, since I've seen you live in the flesh. So th- this will this will do. Yeah, this we will don't do. have to. And you you're handsome, even blurry. You're, you've always <laughs> been a good looking fella. Um, what do what is I mean? Like I I hate to sound like 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 a Mark Marin or an insecure comedian, but I I kind of thought I'd ask on the record like what is like what do you think? of me what was my reputation because you and i started i started maybe a little after you in new york but like i always kind of looked up to you and 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 admired you a great deal and i i hope i was always cool and that i that was always how you received my feelings on you i guess i didn't you weren't one of those guys who was busting up hotel rooms or you know being uh you know you didn't have a sort of irascible character you you, you were I found you kind of easy going, man. You know, I found you kind of like an easy going dude. Maybe there was another side I didn't see, but in general, our interactions were always pleasant. You were prolific. You were always, always had some new stuff you were working on and you delivered the goods, man. So that, that is sort of my, you know, we weren't buddy, buddy, but when we see each other, we were, it was always a pleasant interaction, you know, and I was not really buddy, buddy with too many comics. I sort of, went there and did my work in the comedy world and interacted with people and then got out of it. And, and, you know, uh, hopefully not too traumatized. Yeah, so it was, it was, uh, you know, good. Yeah. Who, you know, that was my take on you. Well, I appreciate that. I'm glad that that was, uh, that, that that's what it is. It means I was fishing for, for that. And it means a lot to me, but you were a hustler. I can't, I can't forget this. You're a hustler. You were always like, you know, working on something, you know, it wasn't just like phoning it in. It was always, kind of a project or some I remember this radio stuff. There was always something going on pre podcasting and all that. So let me add that. Yeah. Uh, that thank would be thank you. That's a grit. That's I'm, I'm not known for uh, my talent, more my grit grit. You know, you can't, <laughs> you can't uh, teach that kind of thing. I was always a small guy. So I always felt like I had to work harder in sports and stuff in high school. And I felt that way in comedy too, that I had to run, you know, more the sprints and, and, and harder than everybody else who was better than me. Well, I think you, I think you made that, uh, I don't know, I, I don't even think of you as a small guy, but I just think of you kind of as, as a low, low key blur of energy. There was always, there wasn't like a lot of sedentary Pete Dominic stuff going on. It was always like, <laughs> there he is. He's there again. He's doing some more shit over here. He's doing something over here. And, you know, I, I like that kind of energy. I like seeing that. So, um, it was, it was 
it was pleasant to be around, man. I'm Always. happy to hear that. And enough about me and and and, and the past and everything. I'm, I'm I just I kind of like you know as I was thinking about this conversation, I was like you know I'm gonna I wonder what DC really thought of me. I certainly know what I think of him, which is why I reached out oh. and, and wanted to tape a conversation with you. Did you? Ever or do you now have like a lot of close friends, whether it be in comedy or, or outside comedy, like male friends that you really trust, spend time with, talk to? Uh, I have close, close friends, not too many. You know, um, I have uh, I have a lot of people in comedy who I like, a lot of comedians that I like, you know, that I kind of I hang out with them when I see them but sort of outside of comedy not many um and and I, you know I I've become more kind of like a hermit as I get old, older I hate to say it you know we moved out of Brooklyn we're I'm in a uh, in in Long Island way out uh two and a half hours out of the city and you know, I, I live kind of a solitary existence with with my wife um, and animals. And, you know, I see friends and family intermittently, but uh, I've gotten pretty introspective and and not I hate to say antisocial, maybe not antisocial. I don't know if this is interesting to anybody, I but, you know, or if there are other people that are going through this, but it's kind of where I am in life. You know, it's that uh, I I was, you know, P, you know, it's like for, for years I, I managed nightclubs prior to doing comedy. Then I was in nightclubs doing comedy. So in a sense, I was I, I was sort of overloaded on being hyper social, being around people so much. So now I'm just kind of uh, enjoying a, a bit of solitude. And I'll pop into the city, do some sets and stuff like that. See some old faces. It's wonderful. I mean, it's it's awesome. And then I come home and it's it's quiet and I, th- that is the you know that's sort of the foundation for me. Uh, I think it's so, I, I actually think it's super way. it's super interesting. It's something I talk uh, uh, with a lot of you know guys around our age about because there's there's no right or wrong answer, but there's a lot of you know there's a lot of really interesting research around middle aged men and 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 friendships and loneliness and how we relate to each other and so on. And I'm kind of determined to to understand that and, and to work on that. But it sounds like for you, you've got a really good balance uh, of it all with, with where you're at. Do you ever, do you feel ever like you wish you had more, you know, socializing, more relationships, talking to people on the phone, getting together with people or anything like that? Or I miss, I was telling my wife this, I miss having friends like when I was a kid, um, like that, those yeah. buddies, you would just go, you'd go bike to Rock Creek park and catch crayfish or, you know, shoot BB guns or do that. I I miss that. Uh, And that might be just missing youth itself. And it might be also as, as you grow older and your friends change and people evolve, there's kind of more disappointments associated with that. And, and I kind (laughs) of try and relive that. Like I have my neighbor and like, you know, we'll go, he'll be like, Hey man, you want to go shoot some BB guns at some cans and stuff like that? I'm, I'm 55 years old, man. I'm like, yeah, let's, let's go do it, man. Or he'll, you know, he's got a, he'll have a, a, a new old car he's working on. Let's go take it for a spin and we'll do stuff like that. Um, and, and eat junk food or whatever. I mean, it's like <laughs> kind of small <laughs> acts of rebellion. <laughs> I, I don't know that, that kind of, bring me back to being young, but I do miss having, um, I do miss having a, like a, a best buddy that I hang out with. It's like, you know, our lives, my friends that did function in that capacity, our lives have well, changed. They get yeah. the kids and the kids are in college and this and that, and, you know, can you think geography. of the, can, can, I hear you totally. And I, I long for that. I actually get together with a lot of my old friends every year, uh, friends from that I grew up with, but, but at this point, your age, our age, is there like an activity or something you could see? I mean, some guys, they get together, they go golfing or they have some activity. They go to the game or maybe they play like, I know guys who play like Dungeons and Dragons or cards or something every week. Is there hypothetically, if there was like an activity that you'd be like, yeah, I'll do that with you guys. I mean, I I would hang out and do that as you know, anything. You know, the idea of fishing has been floated around a lot. Uh, I've tried it myself. Uh, I wasn't, I did catch a porgy, um, 
<laughs> uh, but I, it, it's been floated around. A lot. I sort of like the idea of surf casting, you know, just being on land, not having to go out on a boat. You know, you know I'm not super nautical and all that stuff and, and being able to leave when I want to leave. That's a, that's a big thing in my life now is I always have to have an exit plan. I always, I can't do anything unless I know I, I'm a, and, and I don't think I used to be like that, but I think I need to know when I'm, when the dismount is and then I can relax with it. Um, but back to the activity, I don't know yet. I don't, I feel like I have to, I feel like I'm less adventurous than I was with trying new things. Um, or new, you know, because I'm kind of content with your new people. I, you know, I give new people, but I have a very low threshold. Yeah. You know, one fucking disappointment, and we're done, man. We're done. You know, one, one, one thing, and I'm like, I just don't need it. I'm not gonna. I have, I have friends that are kind of high maintenance that I, you know, that are I'm very tight with that I'll, I'll put up with their stuff. You know. You know, it's not like uh, it's not like we're in a relationship and it's a girl and you're getting, you know, you're getting ass from it. So there's this payoff. You right. know, it's your friends. Right. So <laughs> there's, you're putting up with their stuff and I don't need more stuff to put up with. So somebody has got to be kind of low maintenance, I think, at this point to be a friend, you know, um, but that's impossible. You know, I think that's an impossibility. We're all so crazy. You know, maybe it's, not you, no, but no, you know, I, I, uh, I, you know, I mean, I definitely am because. And I totally hear what you're saying about the threshold and one small disappointment. I've been able to curate a lot of people that, you know, I, I get along with well. And in some cases doing the show, like people who listen to the show become really good right. friends with, which is amazing. But they listen to the show because they generally like my sensibilities or, you know, they don't think I'm a fucking maniac or, a, you know, a racist, sexist prick. But but I mean, like, yeah, I meet new people, especially having kids and, you know, you meet their dads. And it's just it takes like just a minute sometimes like now. I'm good. Thank you. Thanks for coming by. That's what it is, man. That's what it is. Where before you would just overlook it and keep going. And then there might be three, four of those things. They still hang out or whatever. Now, man, the dismount is swift. You know, there's, it's not a combination. It's a one punch knockout. It, that's it. You know, the dismount is, it's got you- very swift. And it's the irony is I'm not swift anymore. I'm older. I'm, 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 I'm slower, but that part, boom. You know, do you have I'm uh, out of there. do you have an example or a story of like just a dude like just being like, you know, some kind of behavior, something he says, something he does that you're just like, it might not even be like offensive. You're just like, I'm not interested in, in, in hearing you talk about whatever anymore. I just I can't. Uh, I can't, you know, I can't even remember the specifics of the dialogue, but I was out here. I'm, I, I have been very uh, uh, my wife's made a lot of friends. <laughs> I haven't really. So I'm kind of on the lookout for somebody with like some similar interests. You know, maybe we can hang out a little bit. Maybe we can collaborate, shoot something, you know, whatever it is. And I was talking to some, we were at a bar and I, uh, a guy, I was talking to this guy and he was kind of funny, you know, like, ah, all right, you know, it's kind of funny. And my wife's talking to somebody else. We're, we're talking, whatever. And then unfortunately, <laughs> And I hate to say it, but the politics came up and I, I avoid that. The politics came up on his end and he was real heavy duty um, with what he felt. And I'm kind of, you know, like I said, I'm kind of easygoing about it, but it was like way over the top conspiracy theory stuff or whatever. I'm like, I can't I can't sit with this dude. Yeah. And I, I can't be alone with this guy. Yeah. And I got to hear this shit if we're on a road trip or something like that. Are you kidding me? I can't. No, 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 no. I can barely take it here over a couple IPAs, you know? So, I, you know, that it's not a really funny, specific no, example I, of the I dialogue, think but it just... I think that they, I don't think that that's a, you know, a, a, I think that's a low threshold thing. Like when people start going, especially when you first met them and you're starting going down some conspiracy theory path, like that, that, it immediately says you must think a lot about this must draw, really drive your, your life, which... Uh, which is going to be problematic for us, probably. I think. Yeah, that's- and it's like you know, politics and religion. When people get real heavy, start swinging that bat around up front. You know, I don't need to be proselytized to. <laughs> I don't want to be converted. I just, you know, you can believe what you want to believe, but when it's just swung so heavily up top, 
I it's just, it. uh, you know, it's, you, you get emotionally bruised from it. And I don't need it in the, in the trying to have a, you know, a good kind of karma around me. This is, you know, I have a, I think I have a, per- I probably have a, a, like a lower tolerance or threshold. I had a guy recently that I just met and kind of talking to, and he started talking about how he had a gun on him and he always carries a gun. And I was like, it's not even that you carry a gun. It's that you had to tell me that right away was such a turnoff to me that it made you look yeah. so insecure that, you know, confident guy with a gun doesn't tell you he's wearing it. Uh, uh, you know, he, he's not really yeah. as concerned, maybe. I, I, I felt, what would you do with that? You just meet a guy and he's like, you know what? I always carry a pistol. Like, really? Yeah, well, that, I'm, I'm there with you. I have a brother that carries a gun all the time and we are estranged. You know, it's it's for his job. He's a U.S. Marshal. Well, it's for his job. It's like, you don't need it at the breakfast table, buddy. When we're at home, we don't need it at the breakfast table. It doesn't have to be shown at the breakfast table. We got pancakes here. You know, we don't need a Glock in the in between the sausages or whatever. And it's 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 uh it's it just speaks to that that person's self esteem that they have to be you know they're the boss of everything and they gotta have you know they gotta they gotta lay down the gun that you gotta know there are it, it's it's I don't mind you carry a gun you know but it doesn't you know. We're not enthusiasts at the breakfast table. This, you know, talking about it's not the NRA meeting at the breakfast table. So I, I feel you on that. That's that was that overcompensating uh, thing. I think that, uh, I just think you know. there's a stark difference, and maybe there isn't, but I think there is between people who who have guns or even are really interested in in in, in guns and those who who tell you about it real quick, like right away. I kind of I'm like, what are we five? Like, why don't you just take your dick out and we'll measure. <laughs> And then we can just be done with it all because it's a real weird thing to uh, to do a real kind of uh, strange alpha behavior that I I never really understood. But you you had you had a really interesting like childhood because of where you grew up and and to some extent when. But I mean, like you grew up in, in D.C. and like a very multi ethnic community, which is why I think a lot of people, including me, I never was one of those people who thought you were anything but white, but I know a lot of people did thought you were either Hispanic or even black, but I definitely knew from the moment I saw you. And I think because I share this trait with you to some extent that your sensibilities were such that you had grown up with multi-ethnic, you know, neighborhood and that you were very comfortable around, uh, do, certainly doing comedy in front of, which is really comfortable, much as just hanging out with 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 people from a lot of different backgrounds. So, what, what was your childhood like? Where did you grow up? Well, you know, the thing for me was that, and, and I'll try to encapsulate this kind of quickly, but I was always an outsider. Um, growing up in D.C., you know, it, it was D.C. It's politics, or it's people somehow uh, connected to politics generally in, 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 you know, they're working in the government They're And my family, my parents were artists. My mother was a dancer. My father was a painter. And I grew, and I grew up in a house where there was my mother was my father's muse. Uh, and, and there were naked pictures, paintings of my mom all over the place. So when my friends came over, they loved to come over and be like, wow, you know, um, and we and we we start, we lived in a kind of really rough neighborhood at 14th and P, which was you know a rough neighborhood in DC back in the 70s. And then we moved to kind of the you know lower middle class suburbs. Um, and we were the broke family on the block. You know, we were the ones on welfare. You know, I had to go get food, take food stamps to Safeway and whatever. And I went to you know, public schools and everything. And it was a very, it was a polyglot. It was, uh, everybody was there. And I always looked like this kind of beige kid. Nobody knew what, you know, as I get older, I look maybe a little whiter, but when I was, a, 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 I just looked like this little Latino mixed kid that was running around and couldn't speak Spanish, you know? And so I kind of hung out with everybody. And because as, as like high school came around and stuff like that, um, I, you know, I, I, my family didn't have money. You know, we weren't, we were broke artists. Um, and so I somehow 
my parents got me into a private school for a year for, for, and I ended up being like the broke kid in that private school. And I ended up, my first job was being a janitor, a janitor's assistant, uh, helping, helping the janitor <laughs> at the school. And I, I think I told somebody this, but, um, because I stayed after school every day, I was in trouble every day. And the principal's like, you might as well get paid for it. You're in trouble. You might, you know, uh, so I was, the, there was this Jamaican janitor named Paul. And, um, he, uh, I was failing math. I remember I was failing abysmally. I've never been good at math mm -hmm. and I was failing. There was some math class and, and, uh, you know, I would try and cheat. And the guy always caught me. He always caught anybody that cheated. I could never figure out. No one could figure out how he would do it, but there was no way I was going to pass unless I cheated this horrible, horrible admission. So I'm talking with Paul one day and, and, you know, we would clean the toilet. I'd, I'd clean the toilets and wash the blackboards and sweep and do whatever. And, uh, it was math and in chemistry. This guy taught two classes and I would fail both of them. And I had to, if I didn't pass this time, uh, I'm going to, I would have to go to summer school and whatever. And, and Paul said, you know, he's like, what this man, he go, what this man do when him, teach before I put the test down. What this man do? And I'm like, what do you mean? He's like, what him do? What him do? What him, what is his habit? And his, I'm like, his habits, his habits. I'm like, well, he, he washes the, the blackboard. He's like, yes, he washed the black. Why well, when you put H2O upon the, upon the slate there, the H2O upon the slate. And I'm like, uh, you know, it gets wet. And it get wet, yes. What the property it have? It did, you know, tell me about the property. And I'm like, it gets shiny. He's like, when something shiny and wet, what when you what does man do and, and I'm like well he's always facing it and he's like what am I so so I'm like there's a reflection he's like yes man I'm looking I'm looking look upon the reflection I'm see you cheating that's all I bust you so this dude explained to me that the reason this guy caught everybody cheating and he goes that's chemistry right there that's chemistry you know is because he'd see the reflection in the board so I cheated on the next test. I waited till he was finished <laughs> uh, watching the board till it dried. And then I cheated and, and, and passed. Brilliant. Um, but I, anyway, that's, that's probably, that's a horrible thing to admit to, I guess, but that was my I didn't know. No, I mean, I, a, a janitor. I, I convinced myself in high school, I too struggle with math and, and science. I convinced myself that I wasn't as traditionally as smart because I couldn't remember things i could study harder than the next guy but i just wouldn't stay in my mind no matter how hard i tried to write it down i said just didn't stay in my brain i was like i don't have those kind of smarts but i do know how to to cheat and i you know i never cheated in other ways as an adult i never stole anything as an adult i'm a pretty goody two-shoes but i cheated the hell through middle school and even college because i just i, I couldn't i wasn't able to learn i felt the way that other students were able to learn and i was put in this you know, system that you had to succeed in this way. And I never really did in school. It was never my thing and still isn't. But my brain could not handle those concepts of, of math, of geometry, algebra and chemistry. It just I was I was, you know, I was great with writing. I loved writing. I, I loved history, I, all that stuff. And I would work so hard, but it just I couldn't understand it. It was like there was a piece missing. And and that was and and the fear of like getting not only being kind of an outcast at this school where a lot of people were wealthy, they'd go on ski trips to Gstaad or whatever, and I'm cleaning the toilets and I couldn't go on the ski trips, you know, um, and they'd see me cleaning the toilets. And, and it was just it was a horrible time in my life. And I eventually got kicked out of that school, and went to public school. Um, I got here's a, a good thing that came out of that, though, is I got kicked out. I got into this fight with this kid. Got kicked out of that school. Went to public school, had a blast in public. It just it was wonderful. I, I, you know, there was people, all these different people. There were broke people. I wasn't the only one. There were pa people whose parents have artists, you know, whatever. I discovered, like, sort of the roots of doing stand-up comedy there. I moved to, I eventually moved to New York after, after college. I don't know anybody. I've lived in the Bronx. I, I've just moved from the Bronx to Times Square. I don't know anybody. It's New Year's Eve. I'm miserable. I bump into the kid who I got into a fight with in uh that we got that i got kicked out of school with and he's like hey man i'm having a new year's eve party why don't you just come by so in my head i'm like i got into a fight with this kid he's gonna i'm gonna get jumped if i go to this thing but on the other hand i'm like maybe maybe not maybe it's legitimate i don't know and i don't have anywhere to go so i'm like i'm going so i had like a roll of quarters in my pocket 
I was drinking rum. I showed up like ready to rumble. The doors open. He, he answers a door to his apartment and he's really nice. And everybody's really nice. And I see this woman sitting on a couch and I just go talk to her. She's beautiful. We end up hanging out together. Uh, we, it, 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 she's like, I got to go. I have to go do something. Uh, meet me at this club later, Mars in the meatpacking district. And uh, I said, okay. I went to Mars later. The line's around the block. I didn't have a nickel in my pocket. It's like $150 to get in. I told a guy it was Jeff Goldblum's uh, cousin. I went up to the front uh, to the doorman and said I was Jeff Goldblum's cousin, Aaron Goldblum. And I'm supposed to meet Jeff in there. And I need to get in there immediately because there's a film being shot or whatever. This guy was like, fuck it. Just go ahead in. Right. <laughs> I went in. I see this. I see this lady, uh, this girl. We hang out the rest of the night. I said, where, where, what did you have to do? She said, I had to go break up with my boyfriend. Uh, uh, we hang out the rest of the night, and that's how I met my wife. No! You know, and we've been together 27 years. Yeah. So out of that, out of being a janitor at that school, something good uh, happened, you know? Wow. <laughs> wow, I mean, there's so many reasons why that wasn't going to work out. You could have said no yeah. to the... You know, just starting with the hey, come to my house. You could have said no to the the party, uh, and you could have not gotten into that club. But you, the way that you got into the club, what a I get. Well, I mean, what an well, unbelievable. You know, that came from me managing nightclubs. There was a guy who in D.C. I used to manage this uh, black nightclub called the Ritz, and every week there were these guys like that would be imposters that would show up and say they were celebrities, and it would be like. One guy, he would come up, he, he used to say he was heavy D and he looked mildly like this guy, heavy D, you know, big light skinned dude with these glasses. But we'd always be like, OK, man, lift up the glasses because heavy D had a lazy eye. That's why he wore the glasses. The real heavy D did. And he lift up the glasses and both his eyes were normal. Like, bro, you're not you're not heavy D. <laughs> your, your eyes your eyes are looking this way. So it, that having dealt with those guys week after week after week gave me this sort of Jeff Goldblum thing because I mildly looked like him at the time. And um, it just it just worked. I just was very authoritative and went in and then there she is. And, and we just we just clicked, man. We just clicked and we grew up 20 minutes apart. That was the crazy thing. And never saw each other in uh, D.C. or Virginia. You know? Oh, wow. And then there you are in New York. Wow. I was going to ask yeah. you at, at some point about your wife, because I was trying to remember, like, what I thought. And let me try to put it this way. D.C. Benny is a really well-known comedian in the New York scene. All the comedians respect him. And one of the things that's kind of weird about him is he's, he's this tall, really good-looking guy by pretty much everybody's uh, opinion. Guys, women, the way that you were cast, even your headshot was like, you know, smoking the cigarettes. Like, this guy's cool. He's funny. He's good-looking. And then I thought, well, he must get a lot of women. And I'm sure you did. But as long as I can remember, you've been with your wife, like as long as I can remember. So I just remember thinking, wow, she must be really great if, if he's like in this committed relationship, given the fact that he's this stud. And in fact, that is something that I remember about you is that you really always loved your your girlfriend and your wife. And and that at, like you were kind of uh, committed in a committed relationship. Like, I feel like almost the whole time I knew you. Yeah, it really was pretty much the whole time I was in New York. I mean, you know, when I was way, way younger working in a nightclub, even then, I just never really dated. All, it was a, a lot of women. It's just I always was like, I want to find the one. And that's, you know, I, I'm, I'm like that. I'm like, I like my I like my steak and potatoes and I like stuff. stuff. And, and, and my wife, uh, you know, when we were talking that night, I initially wanted to be a psychologist. I love. Yeah. Uh, psychology. And in in um, high school, I took psychology. I loved it. And the, the teacher discouraged me from doing it. He's like, there's no way you're going to be successful doing this. You're not cut out for this. You're, it's got to be. And it just broke my heart. And my wife had her was getting her Ph.D. at age 22 or 23, something yeah. crazy like that at NYU in, psych in psychology. When we met that night and I was like, this is fascinating. We, we have a, a so I didn't want to be with another comedian because, you know, I just couldn't. I, I just didn't want like both of us coming home, be like, why are we getting sets at the cellar? 
you know, <laughs> whatever, you know what I mean? I just didn't want that. <laughs> why, why yeah. you know, why, why are we getting, or, you know, my manager doesn't listen to me or whatever the hell it is. You know, I wanted somebody yeah. in a different, be in a different field, you know, they had their own shit going on and yeah. whatever. So, you know, we've been together. We have similar interests. We've been together. We're like best buddies too. Um, the sex is better than it's ever been. I got to put it out there, man. You know, I, it's, I, I think that's unusual. What do you attribute that, that to? I don't know, man. I don't know. It's just that we're, we work on it. You know, we work on, on, um, <laughs> you know, this is, this is what we have. This is who you're stuck with. You're stuck with this person. So you got to make it the best it can be. And we enjoy hanging out together. And we, we enjoy fucking man. I mean, it's like, it's a, it's a, it's a weird thing in some marriages that people a lot of marriages that people just don't enjoy it or don't have access me, to it or whatever. But the both of us were like, you know, we got to, if it's going to work with us, we got to, we got to, you know, keep doing it. And, um, it just, got, it, it just weirdly got better than it was when we first were together and when we were younger, you know, it's like, I, I think I appreciate it more <laughs> when everything goes all right, you know, and, and, <laughs> uh, it, 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 I don't know. We just kind of, some people grow apart, but we got kind of more in tune to uh, each other. Yeah, I don't know is, if this stuff is, personal, you don't, you but, don't hear that you know. a lot. What with porn. Yeah, <laughs> no, but that's, 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 a, that's great. That's awesome. I'm, I really appreciate you sharing that. Um, now you don't feel comfortable talking about frequency. Do you, I don't get too deep. I mean, like at 27 uh, years, it's pretty goddamn frequent, man. Honestly, it's pretty, <laughs> she's laughing. She's in the background laughing. It's pretty frequent. Uh, like, you know, I don't know what, listen, uh, there's a guy that I know that's like, uh, that's like multiple times a day. Uh, that's, I'm not that guy. Um, and, and, uh, and I think he wears down the, the women in his life and they're like, I just can't handle it anymore. Yeah. It's too much with you. I'm, a lot. I'm trying to make dinner or whatever study. And you know, the, the, the dick is out. Um, I think with us, it's like, you know, three times a week is, is, I don't know how frequent that is, but that's pretty good. I After just, I want to represent, years, I, I represent everybody listening to this show. Thousands of married people were <laughs> standing and applauding for the two of you. We stand and we applaud you and we say you win and we've got an award for you. Bring it out. It's a, it's a third party. <laughs> I mean, I, you know, listen, it's, uh, it, 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 I, I'd say average. That's about, that's about right. That's you know? fantastic. It, it, now you're out I, there. Let me, let's just talk a little bit about your career because like, uh, you know, the question I like to talk, <laughs> I like to ask guys, uh, people that I'm talking to, no matter what they're into, but certainly, you know, comedians who have had a really long career, like about your fulfillment, about your satisfaction. Now I feel like when I look at you and your career there, you've done everything. And, and I was thinking about talking to you and I was like, here's what I want to say to DC Benny. And I think it's important for people that, you know, aren't in the entertainment business, much less comedy to know it's kind of the highest compliment. Everybody in comedy knows who you are and you know, everybody in comedy, give or take, you know, within 10 years of when you started or, you know, uh, they started, everybody knows DC Benny, you've done it all TV shows. You've done tons of commercials. I mean, seeing you like rooting for a guy like you, it's always great when you're rooting for a guy, you really genuinely like that. And you're on, you're watching TV and you see him come on a commercial like, Oh my God, that's so great. Cause he's getting paid. I mean, that was always my reaction. Like good for him. And you're just great in those things. But how do you feel like, how do you look at your career? Having done it all, having known everybody, everybody knows who you are. Like, are you, do you use words like satisfied, fulfilled or, or anything like that? Do you have feelings around it? I think that when COVID happened, uh, I had a kind of a health crisis where uh, I was, Leslie Jones to call me to do supermarket sweep um, and uh, uh, to play uh, I was a cashier, like the main cashier on the game show or whatever. It's not, you know, it wasn't necessarily in my wheelhouse. Uh, Leslie and I went way back. Lenny Marcus and I went way back and they called me and like, and I had to go out to LA 
during COVID at the height of it and uh, tape this, you know, a season of this. Uh, and I was just, I don't know. I was at this point in my life where, how do I, how do I, let me figure out how this is going to come out. But like you said, I felt like I've done just about as much as I could do. I, I, I didn't think I'm, I was going to be famous at this point. I kind of dropped all of that and really started focusing on enjoying my life. Comedy had taken so much from my life. The thing that I love really the most besides my, you know, my wife and everything it was comedy and, and the, the, the grind of doing it and making a living from it had taken such a, a woeful toll on me that health wise, everything else, I think, you know, with the supermarket sweep thing, that was kind of a breaking point. Uh, and after that, when I went back to do the second season, I had, I had some heart issue that I'd never, uh, I'd never, I wasn't even conscious about it. I had no idea. And I, I, you know, I was in the hospital for a week. I thought I was, I thought that was it. And I was like, man, what the fuck am I doing? You know, what am I doing? I have such, I have a great life. I've moved out of the city to kind of be out of the, to lower my overhead and, and, and just, I, I sort of shifted gears with struggling to make a living at comedy to finding other s sources of income that take the pressure off of that and then doing comedy when I could do it uh, and, and not having to worry about it being my sole means of income after 36 years or whatever, you know, of like, you know, you people may not know this, but you know, if you're, you get booked on the road and the club cancels, well, if you're not this known commodity, you're, you're out the money. you got to fill that spot. You got, there's a lot of things like that that can happen and you got bills to pay. So it, and, um, it just, it just got really, I just got fed up with that aspect of it. So I, I kind of built this life where we, we had always, I'd always kind of worked in real estate. That was something that I'd done. I'd learned actually from my mother-in-law a lot about real estate and, we moved out to this uh, to this area, this kind of beach beachy area uh, where there there are vineyards and everything, and it's beautiful. So I'm surrounded by vineyards and beach. And um, we started uh, a couple rental properties. We you know have mortgages out of the ass, but we started some rental properties, and and they've been doing well. And so I'm kind of like this Basil Faulty. If, if that's not too obscure a reference, you know, of, of uh, you know, I'm, I'm running around taking, fixing toilets again and, and uh, you know, uh, washing towels and doing this and doing that. And my, my wife is booking people or whatever. And then, you know, I'll do comedy shows out here once in a while and I'll bring comics out, put them in a rental. And it all it all kind of came together for me. But I'm not really chasing I'm not chasing fame anymore. I'm not chasing success anymore. I've kind of got everything I want in life, uh, which I don't think many people can say, you know, I mean, yeah. Would I like to have a special on that? Sure. I'd like, but the thing is that you get a Netflix special, it's good for a while. Then you got to do another one, you know, because they forget you, you know, it's, it's like, you got to do another one and another one. You get on a TV show, you got to do another one and another one. So that can't be a source of satisfaction and happiness. You know, the creation of itself of the material living the life has to be the, the, the source I, I believe, you know, um, and then things drop out of the out of the sky. You know, I got a I got a Amy Schumer reached out and now I'm playing Michael Sarah's dad on her on her Hulu show <laughs> out of out of nowhere. You know, uh, you know, it was a little audition with just drink coffee. OK, and look disappointed. And that turned into, uh, you know, multiple episodes, which were, were taping. And it, it, it uh, I, I didn't expect any of that. And I, I think, it, I, I think it's kind of the same reason I reached out to you for a less lucrative opportunity to join me here on the podcast, because I think people <laughs> get to know you and they don't forget you and, and they admire you and they like you and they respect you and they want to do something with you. I mean, it's, I'm, I'm sure, I don't know, you know what Amy, your relationship with her was, but I'm sure it's the same uh, kind of feeling that, that that I and many other people who know you have. It's like, listen, this guy's a good guy. He's super talented. He's really good. 
uh, always been a good guy, always solid. Let me, uh, let me see if he's available. I mean, that, that would certainly seem the case. Do you, do you think, did you ever like how important was kind of fame and recognition, you know, for every person in entertainment, certainly every comedian it's there just beyond the horizon. It's very possible that you're going to get there. You have had a lot of tastes of it. You've certainly been around and, and, and toured and been on stage with and, and friends with the most famous comedians in the world. So what, what's your relationship with the pursuit of it all and your feeling around getting it, having it, seeing people who have? You know, uh, <laughs> ironically enough, I, I was really pursuing it when I was younger. I mean, you know, I was all in, um, ironically enough, Patrice O'Neill and I were sitting in a car years ago. I had driven him to the path train to go back to Jersey. We had done a gig together and, um, uh, he's like, you know what your problem is, man. He's like, you, you give a fuck. You got to just stop giving a fuck. And I'm like, I, I'm not like you where I want to walk half the audience and that somehow validates what I'm doing. I like people to like me on stage. I don't need half of them to be like, you know, to, to create a controversy. As funny as he was, I'm not, that wouldn't detract from how funny that guy is. Um, and uh, that always kind of stuck in my mind. We had a falling out and later and, and never spoke again. Um, but that thing stuck in my mind and, and I was like, that's terrible advice or whatever, but really it, it isn't terrible advice. And I kind of stopped giving a fuck about fame and pursuing all that. And just because, you know, I think it's the reminder of how life is really, really short and people around me die and family members and all of that. And I just want to, I'm really treasuring what I have and what I have around, who I have around me. And, and I, I really treasure that. I can, uh, I, I, and I, I, and it's, that's really, I can, that's it, man. It's like, it, it, you know, the other stuff is ephemeral that the fame chasing, it'd be great to, it'd be great to, you know, be able to sell out theaters and do all that and have people, you know, I get accused of stealing jokes from me. That's how long I've been doing this. Like I, there'll be a joke on YouTube that I did 20 years ago. And somebody will see me doing it and be like, there's a guy who does that. I'm like, that's me when I was younger. That's who you're looking at. <laughs> you know, I didn't have a beard right there. You know what I mean? That's, <laughs> that's how long how ridiculous this is. But dude, I'm really, I'm really grateful to be where I am in life and to be alive and to be, to have what I have, you know, and, and to just, you know, to be able to do comedy. I just, it means so much to me just to get on a stage and to make people laugh. Uh, the, the monetary aspect of it is not going to be that important to me now. I just, I just love to get out there and make people, and I love teaching it. You know, I teach it. I, I coach these guys and when they go up there and I, you know, they'll tell a story from their life that they weren't sure that they could tell. And we've worked on it together. And I'm like, you can do it. You can, I'm telling you, you can go up there and tell this story. It's I'm, I'm telling you, this is funny. And when they actually do it and their jaw drops, when people laugh, dude, that's as good to me as me killing. It. You know, it really I, I'm not teaching this stuff because I'm I'm broke and I can't get on anywhere. No, I know what I'll do. I'm going to teach people. I'm going to teach people comedy. I'm teaching it because I, I love I love it. I love it's something I love and I'm I'm sharing it. And it's like we're on a little road trip together. and. And, uh, you know, I, I, I would love for people not to make the mistakes I made because I made mistakes, you know, and, and I made st strategic errors uh, <laughs> along the way of, <laughs> of being a comedian. So, you know, there was nobody to tell me, don't do this and don't do that. And, you know, um, et, et cetera, et cetera. So I feel like it's 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 part of my duty in a way to share that with with younger guys, you, you know, younger comedians or people who want to do this to tell them how this business is and to, you know, prep them a little bit. A lot of that. I love to hear that. I really, that sounds amazing, but a lot of people, you know, we, we can agree that when we were coming up, uh, there was very few people who wanted to, to help you. As a matter of fact, they, you'd more likely be hazed and treated poorly yeah. to try to, you yeah. know, I don't know, toughen you I, I, I'm not even going to excuse the behavior because I always saw it as, awkward and insecure when someone treated me that way and promised I wouldn't 
do that to other people and and prided myself on, on that. You never did that. To, you were you didn't have a, a a mean bone in your body unless someone was addicted to you. But I mean, like no one was going to be that way, generally speaking. So you you so 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 for you, you see it as a responsibility to try to help other people out to mentor younger people. Did anybody do that for you? Not in comedy. Right. Not in That's comedy. what I mean. You know, I mean in comedy. It's yeah. Not- it, Tony Woods, uh, Tony Woods, you know, would lend, tried to help a little bit when I first came to New York. Uh, you know, he, he was he's he was a good guy. He was known for that. Yeah. Um, but no, I think that he was probably the only one. And I, you know, I, I mean, I reached out to people like, hey, how does this work? Or, hey, what do I do? Um, I remember one guy who's very famous right now, maybe in the top three most famous comedians right now but i knew him back in the day and um he had moved to new york and i called him up and i was like i've just moved here man i'm in the bronx i don't know you know where i can get on and stuff like that and he was like man you're waking me up man i'm trying to sleep i don't know just go figure it out or whatever and you know anytime anybody reaches out to me there's a guy i knew Anytime anybody reaches out to me, if I can, I try to give them some advice or, or help them out. You know, I mean, last night, a guy was just like, hey, man, I just I killed at this club audition. I kill and they won't give me feedback and they won't book me. And I don't understand. They won't even take my calls or whatever. And I, was, and I had to, you know, explain to him like, hey, man, this is this is how this shit is. This is like you, this is not a reflection. You killing is what matter. That's. That's what you need to know. You went up there and you killed. Don't let them take that away from you. You know, that's you did what you needed to do. Whatever's going on in that miserable booker's life is what's going on. And they probably lost. They lose their mind. A lot of times they get a little power over people. They lose their mind. You can't let that. You got to keep pushing, you know, so uh, it's it's a it's a I I wish there were people that did that. uh, when I was coming up and yeah, there was the hazing and, you know, there's gotta be that. It's gotta be like where people break, we're comedians, we break on each other and everything, but there's, it, I think it's looked down upon to kind of teach comedy, um, it, it, amongst, amongst, it, amongst a lot of comedians, but I don't, I don't think of it that way. I don't think well, like I I'm think, teaching you. I think well, it's what's, discovering what's funny about you and pulling it out and helping you not make mistakes. You know, that's it. I think it's looked down upon when the person teaching it is not necessarily good at it or respected comedian. Right. When I when right. I heard that you were teaching it, I was like, whoever I, I should hire you, Who, whoever is is taking you know lessons from him is really really lucky because I'm surprised that you know he would be sharing those lessons. Any anybody would be because he's such a talented writer and performer. And let me ask you about that because one thing I really wanted to specifically ask you is looking at some of your old stuff and 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 even now you know you're breaking into the impression of the jamaican janitor mentor of yours i like to think that things haven't changed to the point where if you're telling a story and in that story you're doing voices and those voices are ethnic if you will or you know a certain aged person or whatever that that's not considered cultural appropriation or politically incorrect. Can you still do all those different dialects and voices of all different characters, people that you grew up with and so on? Or is that now not seen as appropriate? Uh, w- w- one of the, you know, when I was still living in Brooklyn, this is like right before the pandemic, there was a show I would do there. I, I talk about this a lot. This just sticks in my and I would go for years, I would go to this show and every time I would do different material, I'd go maybe once every couple months, every time I do a different story. And it always had, you know, my trademark was really stories and I would do the characters in the stories. I don't give a shit. You know, this is, this is my story. I make it as accurate as possible. I always feel like when people come up to me afterwards that are from say that ethnic group or whatever. And they're like, wow, you nailed it. That is, that's what my Dominican super sounds like. You know, that's exact. That's what my, my uncle sounds like, you know, that's the validation I need. I don't need some, you know, uh, woke per, I don't even, I'm not even saying that, but I don't need somebody judging me uh, or, or what. So at any rate, there was a show and I I remember they had changed, um, (laughs) they had changed, uh, kind of regimes, the booking regime. And I got there 
And I was pulled aside and they were like, okay, we don't do jokes about, you know, women. Uh, there's no jokes about rape. There's no jokes about, you know, the, the, uh, homosexuality and no voices from countries you're not from or whatever. And I'm like, first of all, and, and, and they're like, we know you don't do really rape stuff or anything like that, but just countries you're not from. I'm like, I've been doing that, you know, and there's podcasts that, you know, that ask me to do a story on the podcast and I'll have some, you know, I'll do some ethnic characters in the story. Yeah, we can't because the voice is going to be a fan. Fuck all that, man. I, I'm going to do it. That's my life. And that's what I believe in. And if you don't, if I can't do it, then I'm not going to do your show. You know, I'm going to yeah, do what I, I fully do. Agree. So. I, I fully agree. And I think that the, 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 the thing that makes it different, certainly how you've always done it, is you're not doing a pejorative thing when you're doing the character. It's not a put down. It's out to of the love, man. It is really, it is out of love. It's out of, yeah. it's out of friends that I've had. It's out of, it's, it's, it's a direct trickle down from people that I've interacted with that I respect that are family members as well, or, or friends or, or whatever. It's not, I'm not, I'm not shitting on people. Right. I'm not doing it to, to do that. I'm not saying like, I'm doing like this, you know, dumb Indian cab driver. If I do, if I do an Indian cab driver, if, and there happen to be a couple, you know, who, the guy's probably was a neurologist in this country. You know what I'm <laughs> right, saying? Right. He's going to say some intelligent shit. Yeah. You know what I mean? It does. So I don't, I make it a point not to disparage other people in, in my act. And it's usually, I'm the, it, usually what's funny to me is when I interact with somebody like that and I recreate it in my act, I usually get the short end of the stick, which is right. what happens often in, in real life. And, and just that interaction is funny to me. It's like somebody's busting on me, man. I think that it's, it's funny. So um, that's a, another long answer for you, but I just, yeah, I, I, there has been blowback. I hope one day that it'll, the, the dust will settle as I feel like it is a little bit. Ironically, it's in New York a lot. Not so much other places that New York City, the, you know, the <laughs> enlightened Mecca of comedy where you're getting these little oohs and oh, oh you know, that kind of stuff. But um, I'm just I continue to do what I'm going to do, man. You got to be true to yourself and do what you do and what makes you laugh. You know what you think is funny. Right. Well, I'm 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 really impressed to hear a lot of the, the things that are going on and conclusions that you've come to the way that you're talking. And I really love to to watch like when you're posting on Instagram, some kind of improvement you made on one of your properties or something. I mean, there's this hilarious video of you just walking through Ikea saying the the the, the whatever Swedish words. But like you're I, I like that. you're. I've always been impressed. Like I remember years ago when you started fixing up, I think your your home in Brooklyn and I was like, man, this guy really, yeah. you know, this guy really knows what he's doing. Uh, and and you were figuring it all out. But you've used all those skills. I've only gotten better. And and I've gotten a little better myself. And I do a lot of that kind of stuff. You know, I'm in the garden or I'm building a shed or whatever I'm, I'm, I'm doing. I just love to watch you build stuff. And I and I really think it's as impressive the way that you're living your life and everything that you're doing by your own, you know, standard and, and rules as anything that anybody's done in this business because you're doing it, you know the way that you want to do it. And you really genuinely sound and uh, you sound great and that you've come through it all. And I'm, I'm super impressed with the way that you're handling it. And it sounds like it doesn't seem like you ever really struggled with some of the ego issues that some of us did. I'm sure you did, but like, I don't know, you, you've always just uh, been impressive to me and, and still are. And I'm going to stop talking and just say, thanks very much for, for talking to me today. Well, thanks for having me on, man. Right back at you. I love that you've created this, uh, you know, you have your own Pete Dominic world that you can get your voice out there and, and it's heard, you know, and you're not dependent on a club booker or, you know, a, 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 a you know, a, a gatekeeper at a network or whatever you're, I, I, I love the independent spirit, man. And that's who I'd like to surround myself with. Um, you know, that people that are creating stuff, on their own where, you know, your, your audience comes to you and, and they appreciate that. It's not like, there's not somebody who doesn't know what the fuck they're talking about telling you what, what to, what is not fun. We love, 
this about you. You're so funny. Now, just don't do that. Yeah. And here you go. That, 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 that whole, <laughs> this is what we think makes you special and unique. Avoid doing it. Yeah, yeah exactly. Exactly. So uh, I think we're kindred spirits on that. It was a pleasure being on your show. Um, um, you look great, man. You look happy. You look like, you know, fulfilled in life. And uh, it's it's good to interact with you, brother. And I'll see you around, hopefully, in the city. Yeah, or I'll, listen, I'll, be, you know. be, I'll see you out there before I see you in the city. I'm going to come out there and we're going to go fishing or shoot BB guns or something. Maybe you can show me how to put a window in a shed. <laughs> Sounds good, man. Uh, right, take right. care. There he goes. DC Benny, everybody. And... I hope you follow him on Instagram. I hope you let him know that you heard him here on the show. And it would be mean a lot to me if, you, if people reached out to DC. And uh, all his links to contact him will be in the show notes for today's podcast, as they are in every day's podcast. And thank you very much for your support. Thank you to my intern producer, Odessa Sun. Thank you to Johnny Carroll for the music. And, of course, Pete Co for another original introduction. Thank you for subscribing. I hope to see you at tonight's Hangout. I hope You'll rate and review the podcast and tell your friends about it because I can't do it without you. See you tonight, I hope. Otherwise, I'll talk to you right here tomorrow. Bye-bye. Keep right on.